Hey everyone, it's Suzanne here from Lewis and Company Real Estate, and we're very excited to do our second session on Real Talk, where we're going to have an opportunity to speak with some of the people in our industry who help facilitate uh, these fantastic transactions that we do for our clients. Last week, I had a chance to speak to our stager, and this week, we have an opportunity to speak with our mortgage broker of choice, John Sorby of TVH Group. Very excited. Uh, this is a very busy guy, especially right now, uh, that he's managed to take some time to chat with us. And just a little bit of a background. We speak to a lot of first-time home buyers, also second-time and third-time home buyers. Uh, but, you know, I kind of equate building a house like a foundation. Like, this is sort of the foundation is really figuring out, you know, what you can afford, what makes sense for you, and knowing that in advance of uh, going out there and trying to find a house. And I kind of say it's sort of like shopping without your wallet. If you don't, you know, this is where you need to start. You need to start at this level and speak to a mortgage broker to figure out what your next steps are. So thank you so much, John, for joining us today and for answering some questions for us. So, hi, John. Hello. Hello. Uh, all right. So um, let's start at the very, very beginning. We have five great questions for you today. Um, you know, basics. What is a mortgage broker? Uh, what is a mortgage broker? And I get this question a lot from first time home buyers. What's the difference between a mortgage broker and going to a bank directly? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, a really good starting point. Um, I think the simplest way to describe a broker is essentially like a matchmaker. So we work with someone on the lending side and we work with someone on the borrowing side. And ultimately we're looking to try and match up the borrower with the best lender to best meet their situation. And um, to give you a bit of an example, which I think also plays to the second part of a question, which is specifically how a mortgage broker and working with a mortgage broker is a little bit different from working with a bank uh, is as follows. So if you, if you went into the TD so Toronto Dominion Bank, and you ask them about a mortgage. I think we can take it for granted that the mortgage you're going to be offered is going to be a TD mortgage. Right. They're not going to look at your situation and say, you know, on the balance of information I've received, I actually think Scotiabank might be a better fit for you and yeah. send you across the street. That's just not going to happen. But if you touch base with a broker, one of our competitive advantages is we can, in fact, go to multiple lenders. So we might go to TD, or we might look at your situation and say, maybe we should go to Scotia. And from our end, again, a competitive advantage, we have the ability to source more than a single lender and a single product lineup. So I think that, again, is a, is a, a pretty big piece of our intrinsic value as a part of this process is matching you up with the best overall lender for your particular circumstances. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. And if you don't mind, for also from my perspective, and one of the things I also tell clients too, um, is this i hear this a lot from clients who um before we've met they say you know what i've already spoken to my bank or we had a we had a, a uh we work with our bank before i you met i met you suzanne or john and we didn't love it you know sometimes it'd be like you know we call and i wouldn't hear from them for like a week or they wouldn't call me back or they the person at the bank changed and they lost you know the file was different. I had to repeat the whole story. I mean, I think one of the one of the pieces, to correct me if I'm wrong, but also working with a mortgage broker is service. Yeah, you know what? I mean, I, I certainly can't hold it against anyone who starts at a, a company and hopes to make progress. So, you know, you use the example of your typical branch baker. Most of them are hoping to be able to take that next step up. Uh, and fair enough for them, but it can make it difficult on the client who maybe has to switch providers at the branch two times, even three times, sometimes depending on how long the process goes. And that lack of continuity um, can be very difficult because at the best, you're re-explaining your situation. At the worst, you may get someone who maybe doesn't have as much experience handling your file at some point. Again, another competitive advantage, I think, in our firm here as brokers is, you know, I, uh, I'm not aspiring to a, a job at head office because this is, this is what I do. This is, in fact, all I do. I'm a specialist. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm pretty happy about that. I really enjoy what I do. And as a result, I have clients who have been with me for, you know, a decade plus. You call me today. You call me a year from now. You call me five years from now. You're going to get me. 
And right. I think that ultimately that's a, that's a helpful piece of the puzzle because I'm not saying financing is, is confusing per se. I don't think there's anything we do that's, that's terribly difficult, but we do it every day. And so we're used to it. And it's hard for someone who's only, you know, I mean, how many times does someone buy a house over their lifetime? Three times, four times? Yeah. That's an awful lot to ask someone to get all the way up to speed in a short amount of time on a situation that could have changed very dramatically. The nice thing in working with us is we'll know your circumstances. We'll understand your own personal interests and sort of caveats. And again, we'll go back to the whole marrying you up with the best person to provide loans in that circumstance. Right, right, right. Yeah, the, those, I mean, those are so important. I think people don't realize, you know, what op, what options there are out there. So those are great things to touch upon. So thank you. Number two, I hear this a lot as well. Uh, when I first meet with people, they're like, you know what, Suzanne, uh, I, I am pre-approved. I went online and I filled out this form and I answered you know, 17 questions or how many questions are, I'm not exactly sure. I answered all these questions and uh, yep, I'm pretty approved. I'm ready to go. What is the difference between that and what you do for them? So again, back to the idea of a pre-approval. If you apply on BMO's online pre-approval tool, ostensibly you'll know what you're pre-approved for at BMO. That doesn't right. mean that's what you might be pre-approved for at RBC. So again, it's a function of limiting yourself to an individual lender. Um, if you hit the right lender the first time around, fantastic. But the likelihood is, um, given there are a number of lenders in the space, there may be one who's better suited to your situation. Right. The other side that I think it's important to understand is um, lending is a game where it's hard to ask for forgiveness. I'm sure we've all heard the expression, you know, better to ask for forgiveness than permission. That doesn't work with things like mortgages. So unfortunately, people can head down the path based on what they believe to be complete information, make very significant financial decisions, and then find out after the fact that perhaps it was based on a faulty premise. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of times that's not necessarily going to happen. You know, maybe 95% of the time things are going to be okay based on that initial pre-approval. But having done this long enough and having enough people in my office over the years who found out the hard way that that wasn't in fact correct, I can tell you, you'll feel exactly 0% better if you end up in that 5% who ultimately didn't get what they thought they were getting with that pre-approval. Right. So for me, the pre-approval is, is something that favors the lender. It's kind of the least effort on their part to give them the best chance at the client's business. But in my opinion, what it ultimately does is it puts the client at the most risk. Hmm. And based upon that is sometimes I'll meet with buyers and they're like, yeah, no, no problem. Um, you know, uh, it's currently February, but we were pre-approved in June. That should be fine. Can you talk a little bit about how long, what that means and how long pre-approvals are good for? Sure. And again, this is, I think this is timely because we, uh, we think about June to February, I think under regular circumstances, we don't think that's a very long time. But if we think about, say, the last seven or eight months in our current circumstances with things like COVID and all the changes that have taken place, it can actually be a really long time. Right. Um, typically for a pre-approval, our best case scenario is about 120 days, so about four months. So anything outside of that, um, and there is potentially change. And that's before you even get into discussion about policy, um, lending guidelines do change on a regular basis. And the point I make is a pre-approval is not an approval. I mean, that's, that's why they have different names for them, right? right. So uh, until you've actually had a lender go through the fine detail of the, the transaction, whether, you know, the, the home purchase or whatnot, until they've seen the property and signed off on it, until they've reviewed your income and signed off on it, which they're not doing, generally speaking, with a pre-approval, if for no other reason than at the pre-approval stage, most people haven't identified the property they're going to be buying. Right. Again, right. it still leaves the door open for potential risk. And the longer you go from the point where you've had that pre-approval take place, the greater the risk potential becomes. So the reality is four months probably on the top end is mm -hmm. about as long as you can go. Uh, and what we like to do is we actually like to go through the individual property with the, the, the potential borrower at the time they look to make an offer. And I think we found over the years, 
that's really the best way to mitigate risk and put them in the best possible you know, position to be successful with their offer and ultimate closing on the financing. Right, right, right. Yeah, lots of moving parts, right? In between there, between, uh, yeah, between the pre-approvals, the approvals, the offer, the closing. Appraisers, time- lawyers, inspectors, real estate agents. Again, the list really does go on. I mean, I think if, uh, if, it's, if it's a good pairing, like, you know, the work that you and I have done together, a lot of that becomes invisible for the client. But again, yeah. my, my experience is it's the pre-work that we put in that helps mitigate the risk. Because again, um, it's not always necessarily something people think about up front. But again, hard, hard in lending to ask forgiveness after the fact. If they don't like it, the lender is not going to move forward. And that can leave people in a pretty precarious position. Right, right, right. Yeah, like you said, there's definitely a lot of stuff going on behind. Um, hopefully, like you identified, uh, clients feel like it's more of a seamless um, and hopefully stress-free situation for them. But sorry, but there is definitely a lot going on behind the scenes. Um, okay, so question about this, which I ask you this all the time through emails <laughs> and texts. Uh, rates are so low right now as I think most people know. Um, what do you think is gonna happen? I actually wrote down in the future, which I think is sort of big. Uh, <laughs> but what do you think is gonna happen, say by end of the year? Like what's what's your sort of prediction or what are you hearing? What do you know? What's your insider scoop? What's the intel? Does, does the video capture my shoulder shrug? I mean, I, I, <laughs> here, here's what I would say. I mean, there are lots of things that are possible. Um, I tend to focus more on the probable. I think probably we're range bound. So to, to put things in context, rates are at an all time low right now. Yeah. And we might see uh, mortgage rates come up 10 or 15 basis points today. Maybe they drop five or 10 basis points tomorrow. Um, as a general rule, depending on the term you choose, variable, fixed, et cetera, you're looking at money that is likely going to be less expensive than inflation. For those of you who uh, spent any time in an economics classroom, the veritable definition of free money is at a cost lower than inflation. So we are technically dealing with the economic definition of free money. Um, Between now and the end of the year, my expectation is we're probably going to stay pretty much in the same position. Um, My logic is, is as follows. When the government eventually lets us know what's been spent on uh, the COVID um, crisis, you know, for 2020, I expect a deficit somewhere probably in the half a trillion dollar range. Hmm. Um, We'll probably see a similar number for 2021. So say in in two years, we're going to take a deficit that was six or seven hundred billion dollars and turn it into at least twice that, possibly more. that means you're in a position where the forces that be are not going to be particularly enthusiastic about raising the cost of funds. Um, now, some of that is market controlled. Some of that is a little bit more artificially set. That's probably a whole different uh, conference call. But um, the bottom line is, I don't see anything over the next 12 months in terms of radical price increases on the cost of money. I just don't see that anyone wants that. Um, certainly there are a lot of, uh, consumers and businesses looking to rebound that don't need that. Um, you know, what we want and what we need are sometimes two different things, but I think in this instance, they actually dovetail relatively nicely. Mm. And I, I can't see that we're going to be appreciably higher with regard to the cost of money anytime soon. I know we talked about this, you and I briefly, uh, sort of mid last year, but question about like, so how will COVID and uh, potential buyers 2020 taxes affect their eligibility in the future? Well, it depends a little bit on the individual. So for example, if you're um, a a school teacher, I've I've got a lot of family who are school teachers, uh, various uh, hybrid models right now. Some people are teaching online, some people are teaching part-time in the school. But the bottom line is there's a lot of security there. They're salaried individuals. Uh, it's, it's, it's typically through a municipality or the like. So again, very solid security there. There's been no fluctuation or veritably no fluctuation in what their earnings would have been for 2020. Right. 
Right. Um, so their tax returns will not factor. Uh, people who might have been, however, say commission driven or um, who are self-employed, it depends on their circumstances. I'm dealing with a gentleman right now. He runs an online business. Guess what? His 2020 revenue numbers are going to be up significantly. So for him, it's going to be a positive. I have a few other folks who are commission driven, driven salespeople in industries that have been largely curtailed over the last 12 months. They're going to see a significant decline. Um, the bottom line is it will vary by industry. Again, another reason why a pre-approval will only tell part of the process or part of the picture with regard to the process, because they might say, you know, enter in your last two tax returns being 2018 and 2019. Right. Well, if, if you as, as the individual entering that information knows for a fact that your 2020 tax returns are going to be markedly lower because of COVID, then you're not getting a true read on what your borrowing power is. Again, it really is something that I think depends largely on the individual. My experience in terms of the people who are in the market, most people are, are not going to be significantly affected because a lot of people are salaried individuals. It's mm -hmm. traditionally going to be, again, those who either have a significant portion of their, their compensation tied to a variable component, like, mm -hmm. a, like a salesperson or someone who runs that, that business themselves. Those are the ones who I think there are the greatest questions. And in my experience, we usually like to spend a little more time in our due diligence up front when we're working through the file with someone in that kind of an industry, because we recognize the variance is real and we want to make sure no one gets caught out. Right, right, right. Okay. All right. Well, this is like really informative. I feel like we could talk about, uh, there's so many questions. I know there's going to be a lot of questions that a lot of our clients have, um, who, um, we would love to be able to direct to you. We are going to include in this video, um, your website address so they can reach out to you and your name and your phone number and your email. Um, and of course, if you have any questions for John or myself, please feel free to reach out. Uh, and thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today about mortgages. My pleasure. Thanks, John. All right. Enjoy Thank the rest you. of the day. Thank Take you. Take care. Bye.